and will be distributed. Sheldon, it's nice to see you joining from Tina. I'm going to say it again, but I want to offer, of course, that anyone has questions, we're going to use the Q&A uh, feature for today. So those of you who are already on board, about a third of the people who have registered, I think, a little, little under, um, you're going to get a jump start on questions. I did, I, I did try to integrate questions that you asked up front in the registration process into the conversation that I hope that we will uh, have today. And, I'm, and, and we have a fabulous topic and unbelievable, well, unbelievable guest. And I hope hopefully very soon guests. Keep looking down to see if Elliot's joining. At this time yet, well, not this time yesterday. Here we go. Elliot, I am making you co-host as well in the likelihood that somehow your uh, camera may be disabled because, oh, you're just connecting to the audio now. But you should be able, we want, we want you to see, we want to see you and we want to hear and, and, and want to hear you. There we go. Okay, can you hear Excellent. me? Excellent. We hear you and we see you. Okay, I'm All on right. my cell. I'm on my cell phone now because my computer is acting up. If my computer goes on, you may see me twice for a moment when I go in on that. A double portion of Elliot. Excellent. Oh man, more than I can handle. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining us, Elliot. Uh, friends, thank you for being patient. Um, yes, uh, Sally, we are recording this, and it will be made available um, all to all of you who have registered and through the Genesis 123 Foundation uh, email uh, and social media as well. So good evening from Israel. Some of you are here in Israel with us and some of you are on different continents, at least three that I counted. Um, my name is Jonathan Feldstein. If you've never joined us in the Genesis 123 Foundation for a webinar, um, I have the privilege of serving as president of the Genesis 123 Foundation, whose mission is very simple to build bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel. And we always add the caveat in ways that are new, unique, and meaningful. And this is a series, the webinar series that we began uh, shortly after uh, life was shut down in 2020. And I'm very grateful for the fact that now for almost two and a half years, the Inspiration from Zion webinar series spun off to a weekly podcast that I host as the only Orthodox Jew with a weekly program on the Charisma Podcast Network about Israel. It's wonderful. I invite all of you to follow and, and understand what we're doing, um, Jews and Christians together at genesis123.co. One of the things, because we approach uh, our relationships together from our respective traditions, it's important that we also approach us ourselves and one another with mutual respect. And that's sort of the standard that we always have. Um, questions will be taken. You're welcome to put questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will do my best as host to field them and to, and to integrate them into the course of the conversation. And I will have a formal time at the end of the uh, conversation uh, to go through the Q&A before we begin to wrap it up with some, uh, some prayers. We always do that as well. At this point, I'm very privileged to introduce both of our guests. Um, and grateful for both of them taking time late on a, what day is it? Thursday, Thursday night. Uh, Rabbi Dr. Shlomo Brody is the executive director of Amatai and an author of the forthcoming book, Ethics of Our Fighters, A Jewish View on War and Morality. Obviously he is a very suitable guest for tonight's program. He is a highly regarded speaker and writer with articles appearing regularly in the Jerusalem Post and other major sites. He's a native of Houston, Texas, 
and made Aliyah in 2021. Major Elliot Chodoff is a 35-year military veteran and political and mil military analyst specializing in Middle East and the global war on terror. Also a very suitable uh, guest for tonight's conversation. He's a decorated officer with a long and prestigious career, a respected speaker and frequently published commentator in a wide range of major news sites and journals. He's currently completing a PhD in international relations at Bar Ilan University. Elliot is a New York native and moved to Israel in 1983. He is also a licensed tour guide and leads educational tours throughout Israel. And I wanna say both Elliot and Rabbi Brody have been uh, guests on the Inspiration from Zion podcast and Inspiration from Zion uh, webinar series before. And I'm very grateful to have them back and them for the first time together. So I wanna just jump right in. Um, we have a lot to talk about today. And I think Elliot, I wanna begin with you okay. because okay. a lot of people have questions on their mind before we get into the nature of, the, um, of what we're talking about as our topic being fighting an ethical war against an unethical enemy. It's on everyone's mind. It's the elephant in the room. And we know in a couple of months, there are going to be inquisitions and all kinds of other things happening. What, right, happened, so. what happened militarily on Saturday? Um, let, let me start with what everybody is talking about and that is less important than what's being turned into the elephant. And that's the intelligence failure. There was an intelligence failure but it is far less important than other failures that took place that morning. And let, let me start by the, the common comparison, which, is, which begs it since we're on the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, the enormous difference between the int intelligence failure of 1973 and the intelligence failure of this weekend. The intelligence failure of 1973 precluded the calling up of the reserves. And the reserves were critical. The combined forces of, Israel, of Egypt and Syria invaded Israel uh, with overwhelming force compared to what was in the field. Just to give a simple sense, on the Golan Heights, the Syrian force outnumbered the Israeli force in tanks by something on the order of 10 to 1. On the Suez Canal, there were a little over 430 Israeli soldiers, 20,000 Egyptians came across in the first wave. So it's obvious that the forces that were in the field were inadequate. They fought bravely, brilliantly, and, and saved the country, particularly the, the forces on the Golan. But the intelligence failure meant that they were not properly bolstered. What happened this past weekend should have been thwarted. I don't want to say prevented because that's overstating it, but should have been thwarted with the force available to the IDF in place without reserves. So the failure is certainly in, in a perfect world, you have perfect intelligence. You know what the enemy is going to do tomorrow morning and you're sitting there waiting for him saying, you know, come to me. But that's not the real world. The real world is being able to, to be surprised in the sense that I didn't expect it and still handle it if you follow your proper doctrine, op, proper deployment, and so forth. I would say that the underlying, for, for, for a, a religious audience, I'll say the original sin uh, was an over-reliance on technology and I think you've heard me speak about this numerous times, going back to the idea that we don't really need people, we have technology. And as you know, and I think you've heard me say, um, first of all, and, and full disclosure, I'm devoutly low tech. Uh, I think there's a place for technology. But first of all, technology does not stop determine human beings, as we saw this, this past Shabbat. Yeah. And in particular, fixed obstacles, fences, barriers, and the like have an almost 
classical uniform effect, and I'm talking about not only from my personal experience, but from historical experience, on the two sides of that barrier. The people who set up the barrier tend to get really stupid, and the mm. people who are on the upper other side of the barrier tend to become innovative. Because let's face it, when we put up this billion-dollar, super smart, incredibly sophisticated barrier that was supposed to do everything, including make coffee. They knocked it down with a couple of tractors. Correct. But, okay. It was backed up by a super sophisticated sensor data link. I mean, I'm, I'm saying words that I don't even understand. Firing <laughs> system uh, that was in Hebrew called Ro'e Yore. It sees and it shoots. Uh-huh. And they took it out with a bunch of drones that you could buy on AliExpress for about 10 bucks a piece. Okay. All right. So one thing I just want to note when you're talking about the, the difference between people and technology, it's not that different from the situation we were in 50 years ago when uh, Zish Zamir uh, from the Mossad came back from uh from from Lo uh, london having met with marwan i forget his last name but sadat's right. son-in-law uh, saying right. we're, that they're going to attack and that wasn't the assessment of the military experts military. here at the time okay right. thank you for that um rabbi brody um i i do wish that your book was out i want to uh because i i i would be pitching it and and as soon as it is or, or maybe for an advanced copy, you'll give me it, and we'll do a, we'll link this to a review and 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 sell many of them because it is critical. And when we had a conversation previously earlier this year or last year, I don't recall, you said it was coming ready for the end of this year. So sadly, we were thinking about different uh, war possibilities. I'm sure that this was not in your playbook either, um, but I do look forward to to getting that, to promoting it, and reading it myself. Um, before we talk about our side, the ethics and morality um, of going to war. As a rabbi, as a human being, as someone who's who's writing the the the, the penultimate book, what did you see? I, I don't know if you got online on Shabbat when this was all happening, or if you waited until after Shabbat. But what did you see that that particularly challenged your sense of morality and ethics? Well, you know, it was a horrible weekend. I think it should be not only a horrible weekend for a Jew and an Israeli, but for anyone who's looking at what it means to fight just wars. In general, uh, just war theory divides up between ideas of when you can go to war and how you fight a war. Now, let's assume for a minute, and I, I don't agree with this, but let's assume for a minute that you think Hamas or the Palestinians in general have a just case to attack Israel right now. Um, I don't agree with that, but let's assume you had that. But the way in which they were killing and slaughtering civilians, it, it's just plain old terror, but it's a terror in such a severe, disgusting, abominable manner that it's hard not to be shocked to the core in some ways about how human beings can, can go this low. And I guess we shouldn't be shocked anymore by Hamas and many other sort of Muslim terrorists and fundamentalists. But nonetheless, I think all of us in some ways were pretty shocked by how far and how bad it got. So, you know, I, I think that what that calls upon us to do is to, of course, we have to fight and fight back. And we, of course, have to learn some lessons from this experience, as Elliot was referring to, and time will come for that. But I think that it calls upon us now to really think long and hard and saying, we clearly have a just cause here to fight and fight back and deal with Hamas. We now have to ask not just about going to war with them, but what we're going to do and how we're going to fight them, given the fact that we're dealing with such an unethical uh, fighting party. Yeah. And, and that really raises a lot of issues because... We understand, we've understood this for a while, but I think it became most clear right this weekend, is we understand that they don't play by any rules, but, but the level to which they went 
uh, of taking captives of 85 year old women of little children yeah. and all those things I remember all the details raises a lot of profound questions because we don't want to descend to them but we must defeat them we must defeat yeah. evil that's a biblical okay. message and that's a key ethical message and that's one of our challenges we're going to have right now so so i want to come to that i neglected i i just want to point out everybody knows that we're having this live broadcast in the middle of a war i haven't heard any uh at least uh, my red alert siren hasn't gone off in the last little bit but just i want to state should any of us have to leave our the broadcast for any number of minutes fortunately we're each in different parts of the country and elliot i thought maybe you'd be the safest but as of last night who knows um right that was a little harried uh uh, it, it, we, I'm going to invite, if I have to go to my, uh, my my bomb shelter, the two of you, please carry on the conversation and vice versa. So, so Rabbi Brody, I want to get into the specifics, but for people who are not familiar and don't give away your whole book, what are the, what are the main pillars of Jewish standards, military ethics? I mean, it sounds like an oxymoron, but what are the main things that we need to be looking at and then to dig down deeper to the situation that we're in. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a critical point because a lot of times you hear people speaking in very monolithic ways about military ethics. It's, well, we have to protect human rights or we have to just care about winning or something along those lines. And I think Judaism offers a multifaceted sort of perspective on this, which takes into account a number of values. I mean, clearly we do not, we abhor illicit bloodshed, right? And as thou shalt not murder is a very important idea for us. We, we believe in the dignity of mankind and that all human beings were created in the image of God. We have a vision for world peace, right? These are very important values which we should keep in mind. That said, uh, the Bible clearly understands that until the Messianic era, people are gonna have to take up arms for the sake of justice. I mean, that That is a clear value, I think, of the Bible, and that includes to defend oneself, to settle the homeland, and to rid the world of evil. Uh, the other thing that I think is really critical to understand here is that while we would like to have a world in where we can just address individuals for the wrongs they did and not have any bear bearings or consequences on their collective, on others around them, we recognize the fact that we're part of a collective. Individuals are part of collectives. And warfare by its nature is a collective affair. And because of that, there's going to be an element of communal identity and responsibility, which means that we have responsibility for our own. And we have to also understand that there are going to be consequences on the enemy, uh, on the, the group enemy. And I think that keeping that in mind is going to be a you know sort of a major factor here because. In the old days, when we were on battlefields, it was a lot easier to fight wars. Everyone on that battlefield is a legitimate target, particularly when we're dealing with asymmetric warfare and we're dealing with you know urban environments and you, people using human sh shields. It's going to raise a lot of factors for us that we're going to, of course, want to minimize the collateral yeah. damage, but we have to recognize we have to win. We have to uproot evil. And unfortunately, Hamas has placed themselves as a part of a collective. And we're fighting a collective. That is going to be, I think, one of these questions where we're going to have to balance some of those values which clearly come into tension. I, I think there are a couple of issues here that, that we have to take into account. First of all, I agree with you about asymmetrical warfare being sort of in its own league. But the, the truth is that the age of total war, which basically starts with World War II, um, puts us in, in a place where the, you know, the good old days, as you mentioned, where the armies met on the battlefield and, and civilian involvement was was minimized. It wasn't it was never zero, but it was it was minimized. Um, basically went out with industrial war. Uh, you know, the, the you could you could even go back to Napoleon and the, the levee en masse with you know the mass yeah. conscription, the entire nation is at war. But but we'll shorten it, let's say, from World War II until today. Um in which the distinction 
between civilian and military is blurred. Okay, so that, okay. let's you know that that's on on one level. Uh, after all, a Hamas rocket making workshop that's run by you know metal workers who are not necessarily Hamas; they're getting paid by Hamas. Is that a legitimate target or not? Uh, it's it's part of the military complex of of Hamas on that level. So that that would, that would be question number one. But I think a more important one, and and, and your point of collective, uh, I think is 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 very important here. There are two, I think, possible approaches to a collective. Uh, one of which I think is is less relevant, but it it needs to be brought up, and that is, what do you do when the collective is ruled by a regime that doesn't represent its collective? Mm. In other words, it, it imposes itself with force and maintains itself with force. How much of the population uh, can you consider collective with that regime? On well, the other also hand, then, how can you how can you distinguish between the population and and the regime, uh, especially well, okay, with let, Rabbi? Let, let's leave let's leave that for a moment. That in just war theory, that falls into the question of discrimination. I, I'm just talking about that hypothetical case, which, by the way, I don't typically buy over any length of time. It, it, it's my personal contention that a regime that lasts for a long time, and Hamas has been around as, as the regime in, in Gaza for over 15 years now, uh, a regime doesn't rule a population for a decade and a half without the tacit support of the population. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so the population here does have to take responsibility. I want to. I want to take it up a step. Good. Let's look at what's happening as the Hamas terrorists come back into Gaza with their hostages, and the rejoicing in the streets, the abuse of the hostages by the people on the street. Uh, I I saw a, a very interesting commentary today on, on social media. Where is the one mother in Gaza who steps up? to a, an Israeli child and hugs that child and says, I am a mother, this is a child, and nobody touches this child you know, without going through me first. Okay, so Elliot, I wanna play devil's advocate though. Go. L let's, let's pretend that, uh, that, that I'm Abraham and you're God, and I'm negotiating. I, what if, there, what if there are 50 righteous people? What if there are well, 10? What if- where, where are they? Well, they're scared. I was going to use a word that's not appropriate, but they're right. scared. Yes, I agree with you. They are scared. Um, if it's 10 of them, I hope they find bomb shelters. <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, but, before... but, but, but let's be careful because while I do, I, you know, I think there's a lot of evidence that there's a certain amount, great amount of supporting for Hamas amongst the general population. It doesn't necessarily make them targets. I agree and so, with you. and I think you would agree on that. And so, well, I think one of the things that we're going to have to be careful about is to really be careful about what we're targeting, but to understand there's going to be significant collateral damage here. Yes. And those are going to be difficult okay. images to look at. Oh, very. And we have very. to recognize, though, there's a big difference between those difficult images and the images of them coming to Kibbutzim and burning people alive. Those are two different uh, types of attacks. So one was against the civilian, meant to be terror, and the other one, which is trying to take out a military target, which is embedded within an urban environment. Excellent. Absolutely. I want to. I want to. Absolutely. Elliot, before we go, I mean, we're going exactly where I kind of thought we would, but I want to just widen the lens for a minute. Um, most of us in this conversation live right now have not had the distinction and pleasure of serving and the honor of serving in the IDF. So what I wanna know, you, you, you're an officer, you're, you, you, you still do reserves. And what, I, and I what? Have, have many, many Gaza hours under my belt. Okay, so what ethic, I, I, I've never even asked this of my son or son-in-law, but what ethical training, when you're going through your recruitment and they give you a weapon and they give you a Bible and you're going through months of, of, of training, whether you're in, a combat unit or or, or or not, 
What ethical training are they giving you? And is, who is it coming from to say, hey, you might get into such hairy situations and you, need, you might be in a difficult situation. You need to remember X, Y, and Z, that these are our standards. What's it that? Where does that come from? It is part of the training. It's what's called in, in Hebrew, Ruach Tzahal, the spirit of the IDF. Okay. And it's built in as part of the training. You use your weapon. We have a term called Torah Neshek, purity of arms. You're not an indiscriminate killer. You, you use it against the enemy. You use it with, high, with a high level of discrimination. And in some cases, to the extent of endangering yourself, rather than endangering, endangering enemy combatants. That's actually stated. Yes, and it's actually practiced, or it has been. And how have you experienced that in your own military career? In Gaza in particular, uh, making sure, or, you know, I'll, I'll, let me put it a different way. A standard, the standard means of entering a room or a building in urban combat is to lead by throwing in a hand grenade. We don't do that if we think that there are civilians in the room. Okay. Non-combatants. Which means that if there's a, a fighter there who has an automatic weapon, by not doing that, you're not taking out somebody who's about to shoot you. Correct. Okay. And we've come up with innovative ways to get around it. I've actually devised some of them. We're, um, we're, we're all dying to know. Okay. So urban warfare is a great equalizer. In other words, the, the one one of the things that that that's holding us back, so to speak, well, you you think a thousand times before you do it, is that with all of our superiority, and by the way, I, I need to say this parenthetically, with all of what went wrong this past Saturday morning, let's not forget that over fifteen hundred terrorists came into Israel Saturday morning, and virtually all of them were dead by Sunday noon. Okay. Okay. In other words, the 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 IDF's response and its overwhelming superiority came into play very very quickly. That's encouraging. Okay. However, and here's the however, urban warfare tends to be an equalizer. And for a reason that that should be rather obvious and I, and you alluded to it. If you've got a third-rate combatant sitting in a room and you've got outstanding troops going into the room, and they can only come in through the door. That person in the room has an advantage. Okay. Again, unless you lead with a hand grenade. The solution, and we use it today, it's something that I came up with some 20 years ago, is to punch a hole in the wall and come through the wall. I won't go into how we do it, but there are devices and so on and so forth. And that way, he could be facing the door, and guess what? Here we come from somewhere else. And um, and it, and it overcomes the ethical challenge of throwing in a grenade, right. not knowing who you're taking out. That's right, of taking them down. Very I nice. will. Okay, but now I want to add something that was always done in the circumstances of what I have referred to over the past fifteen years or so as luxury war. Yes. Which Rabbi Brody, I want to go go. We'll we'll pick up on this after Elliot's comment. Okay, luxury war is a war in which you can divert a missile from its target because there are non-combatants in the target zone, knowing that tomorrow is another day. The war that we're fighting right now is not a luxury war. The Air Force has already stated the 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 roof knocking technique of firing an unarmed, an, an a non munition device to a roof in order to let people know that this building is about to be struck is not used today. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Thank you for letting us know. Okay. Uh, because we're in a different place. And this, and, and I think this was part of the significance of the government right early on saying, this is not an operation. This is not another round. This is a war. And conceptually, it raises it to a whole different level. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we can target non-combatants. It doesn't mean that we can target um, non-combatant structures just for the sake of taking them down. But it does mean, and this does fall in with, with just war theory as well as, as with the Geneva Convention, which is, which is in line with it, that taking civilians into account is within the proportion of the level of military value of the target. In other words, we you can okay. endanger civilians, and and the law, international law says this: you can endanger civilians if they are present in the area of a military target. In luxury war, we said, you know what? Let's cut them a break. Okay. In real war, we're not cutting that. Break. Rabbi Brody. Well, you're 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 the rabbi and expert. Well. I mean, it's an interesting distinction to make, and I know I, I I think you're right that Israel sort of treated things as luxury wars, you know, as opposed to like. And I think the key point about what you're saying about luxury wars, we were just trying to mow the lawn, as they say, right? Push them back, right? And here we don't think we need to mow the lawn right now. We need to get Uproot Hamas it. out of there, uproot things, and but you know. I, I think it, we one of the things we're going to have to look back upon is to think about whether that approach that we took in previous operations in Gaza was the right one, not just strategically, but morally. Because if at the end result is that we end up having to have years later, just even even greater type of war, when we have such a horrible casualty count, it's hard to justify that. Of course, it's easy to see that in retrospect. It's, 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 it's the, the Amalek question. Okay, I don't even want to get to Amalek. But, no, no, I'm, but, I'm not comparing. I'm saying it's the question, the, the the cruel to the merciful and merciful to the cruel question. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And I, I think, you know, the question you're asking about uh, about the hand grenades and whatnot is relates to a broader question about force protection and how far are we going to go in order to protect our forces to the point where there'll be greater endangerment of non-combatants on the enemy side. Yes. And I, I think in this circumstance, I think Israel is going to follow the strict letter of international law, which properly understood, and this is going to be a fight we're going to have to have with the media and, and, the, and the courts as well, unfortunately, but properly understood, clearly understands that we have a first obligation to protect our own forces. Which and doesn't and mean, win the battle. And win the battle, correct. And uh, I hope and pray that and it sounds like from the rhetoric that's where the IDF is going. But I hope and pray that we recognize the fact that we we can't take losses right now no. of forces because we're being extra careful when Hamas is fighting within you know civilian compounds, when they're fighting from schools and they're fighting from mosques and from hospitals and whatnot. And yes. we, we just, we can't afford that. So yes, if we have the ability and sometimes we have it through technology to be able to send even like these mini drones and to see what's going on and to detect what's going on and know if there's civilians or not. But in moments of doubt, when there's a suspicion that there is a fighter in the area, we have to err on the side of taking out that potential threat. Rabbi Israel Brody hasn't always done that. To our credit, in some ways, but I hope now we're we're going to be erring more on the side of protecting our forces. Okay, Rabbi Brody, I have to ask you a question. I'm listening to you, and you sound like you're a general in the Kiryat in Tel Aviv talking what we need to do. But as the resident ethics expert, is that backed up by by the book that you're writing? Everything that you're saying, I, I believe so. Meaning, okay. th this is where. Again, we're trying to balance values here. So yes, we want to minimize the loss of life and certainly the loss of life of non-combatants, even on the enemy side. Even though the enemy didn't care about killing our non-combatants. Right? They don't because, even care about killing their own. But nonetheless, we believe... I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, we believe that all human beings are created in the image of God. And so we respect human dignity. But that said, when we're forced into a scenario where we have to combat, we have to also think about the value of protecting our own country and our own people, and that includes our soldiers. Right? So at this point, we have to, I think, shift the balance more towards erring on the side of not only victory, but a victory which protects our forces. 
That is going to be very critical. Israeli populations have a very hard time dealing okay. with losses here. So let me ask a question to both of you. We now have peace with four Arab countries, and until a week ago, still moving forward, it seemed, with, uh, with, a, with a large one to our south. Uh, potential normalization of relationships, with, which might have a, a, a trickle down. But as Rabbi Brody, as you just said, we've been operational for the last whew, number of years, mowing the lawn, kicking the can down the road, taking on lux luxurious things that 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 often felt like they were punishing rather than having a specific military uh, goal. And and Elliot, you used the term luxury versus obligatory. I think it was. Is it fair now? Is it legitimate now, based on what we've just experienced, and and it being, it should have been clear that Hamas has as its very goal to eliminate us, and and that they are not ethical. Is it legitimate to say now that there is never a non-obligatory -ob war that we don't have that luxury, if I may borrow your word, in a different context? Okay. First of all, I got to tell you something about uh, full disclosure. I, I've also lectured on military ethics. Okay. Um, but to to your point, I think that we try to do something that good people have been trying to do ever since there have been good people and evil, and that is to try to manage it. And. It invariably fails. I don't want to say absolutely, but invariably fails. Sometimes you can manage it in the short term. By the way, you mentioned my, my PhD. My, the part of my PhD dissertation is about managing conflict and deterring organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah in the short term. That's important. But in understanding that you cannot deter them in the long term. There you go. But now the question becomes, and 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 this this goes into a a faith question, not just in in the religious sense, but also in, in kind of in the moral sense. Do you believe that people can change? Do you believe that maybe someday, hopefully, they'll see the light? They're going to wake up one morning and say, "Wow, Western liberal democracy! How did we miss this?" Uh, you don't want to kill them. I mean, now you know, it's it's hard to get over it. It's difficult, and I, I say this as somebody who's been in this business for decades, it's really hard to get up in the morning and say these people are simply incorrig incorrigibly evil, and the only way to deal with them is to kill them. It, it, it's hard to say it. Maybe I can manage them. Maybe we'll sit over a cup of coffee and they'll figure it out. They're, they'll see that I'm not just such a bad guy. And no matter how many times, and by the way, here I have to say also, for people who are surprised by what happened this Saturday, they haven't been paying attention. They've forgotten the babies who were killed in their cribs by Hamas over the course of the years in different places. Babies who were okay. murdered in car seats of cars. Schools that were attacked and restaurants that were blown up, and they handed out candy while, while after in the aftermath. Okay, have we forgotten all of that? That's, that's so been the roadmap. OK, so should so can we view because our enemies are no longer the state of Jordan, the Hashemite kingdom or, or the or the uh, or Egypt or well, most most of our border countries. Can we say that now the, 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 the enemies are uh, existential enemies and therefore everything is obligatory and therefore uh, I First won't say no holds barred, Rabbi Brody, but. First but, of all, read their charter. Okay. The Jews are responsible for everything evil that's ever happened in the world, and the Jews need to be eradicated. Hamas is an outgrowth of, of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is, is, is a, an ideological ally of the Nazis, and I'm talking about the German Nazis of, of World War II. We had hoped, and, and it was a naive hope, but 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 a natural one for for people like us uh, like us we had actually truly believed that we could come to terms with them and they would come to terms with us and i think that this weekend we reached the point of a one one of the many great lines in the godfather where the godfather says well nobody can reason with this fellow oh i thought you were going to use a different line but okay no i know that like nobody can reason with this fellow enough 
And at that point, there is no more reasoning. There, there's there's okay. no rejoinder. There's no discourse. We have nothing to discuss after this weekend. Okay. Rabbi Brody, uh, is are, are all of our wars heretofore forevermore um, obligatory wars? No holds barred or holds barred within the within the not chopping down fruit trees? No, no, we always have to have some form of limitations and restrictions. But even before you get to that, you know, I think that one of the key questions when you go to war is what are your goals? And this is a strategic question. It's also a moral question. And I, I think part of the issue we've had with since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip, violently, by the way, uh, is the fact that we didn't know what we were trying to do there because we didn't know what the alternative would look like. We didn't really want to go back and occupy the Gaza Strip again. And we thought that on a security level, it was better for us to sort of maintain a bit what was going on there, then try to conquer and, and the territory. I think what's the big shift right now is the feeling in Israel that that's not tolerable. We can't have a situation where Hamas is still in power and able to threaten us after this war. But of course, it, there is going to be a broad question to ask as well. What exactly do we think is going to end up in the Gaza Strip? Right. Who's going to be running it? And, you know, I think that there are some voices that are saying, well, we sort of hope that people are going to run out of Gaza and go to Egypt. And it's interesting, Israel kept open one border crossing. Right? And now it's clearly to Egypt. But the, Egypt, we have a peace treaty with them, our sort of allies with them. They don't want them. They don't want them either. And <laughs> that'll be very destabilizing. So, you know, we, that that's that question is still an open question, which we have a real difficult uh, dilemma to do. But at this stage, I think that the feeling in Israel right now is it cannot end. The end game here cannot be that Hamas is still in power. Okay. So, so, yeah, so yeah. that that goes to Elliot. Go ahead, and then I want to I want to kind yeah, of shift if, the if gears. I could just, just okay, if I could just just add briefly, one of the reasons for the uh, sort of managing the way we did over the past couple of decades is something that's inherent, particularly in democracies, and that's the the short term thinking of leadership. Because you've got to face election in in a year or two or or year who knows you know five times in two years, uh, but you know the world comes to an end periodically, and very often the thinking of the democratic leader, which is different from the fascist leader, who's you know president for life, is what is commonly referred to in in the army as the prayer of the century, century as in the guard, s s e n t r y which is, dear Lord, may it not, not happen on my shift. Uh, you know, right. kick it down the road and, and, and the next okay. guy will have to handle it. It happened on this shift. Yes, it did. Yes, and it did. And there's no no getting out from under that. That, that, that will be to topics of many, many, many conversations and and, uh, and and maybe future webinar here. Let me, let me talk, we were talking about some difficult challenges. To me, being neither an expert in the military or in morality, although I try to live a decent life. Um, one of the challenges that we have on steroids now is that we don't know how many, but we know they have a whole lot of our hostages. How does that uh, jump in either of you and challenge one another? How does that challenge us ethically in terms of um, in terms of what we what we need to do? protecting hostages, making it a point to bring them home or not, which is vulgar to think about, or, and militarily, what do we do to try to get our hostages home? I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here with, and, and, and be the bad guy. Um, I, I'm, I'm terribly concerned about the hostages. I would love to see and I, and I'm I don't want to I don't know so I'm I'm doing this as pure speculation but I would love to see on in parallel uh to the military operation a hostage rescue operation I understand that American special forces are also being allocated for for that possibility the reports that I'm seeing are that at least half the hostages have already been killed 
Okay. Now that's unconfirmed. I'm throwing it out there. Reports that I'm seeing. No, nobody knows for sure. Okay. They're they are certainly not being kept under. You know, but we don't even know how many there are and who they are. We we have an idea. I believe the number is in the 300 range. Whoa. Um, and I range. Okay. It it's not a hundred. Okay. And they have certainly killed some of them since bringing them to Gaza. Now now the question is who and how many and and, and what. But I think that if the Israeli, if there is an, a full scale operation, it's a big if, but I, I think we're, we're moving there. If there is a full scale operation, and if its purpose is to overthrow Hamas and smash it, the hostages need to be taken into consideration, but they cannot be a major planning part. You, you can't. As we, as they say in Yiddish, you can't dance in, in, at two weddings at the same time. You've got to decide. Meaning that the, the hostages are going to be collateral damage. Hopefully not. Do everything no, but, you but, can. Okay. Do everything you can to prevent that, but that is subordinate to a military operation and military. Okay. Okay, Rabbi Brody, where does this stand ethically? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think Ellie is trying to get into ethics here as well, and. Listen, oh, this is this is the worst part right now. And because we were worried in the past about human shields, enemy human shields. You know, I, I'm imagining situations where you're gonna have leaders of Hamas that are literally holding themselves next to women and children, Israeli women and children, and say, You want to shoot me? You're gonna kill this person too. You want to bomb this place? You're gonna have that too. So we're gonna have this is gonna be very, very difficult for us. Uh, but I, I think we need to keep in a perspective of what the goal is. The goal is to protect the Israeli society, to protect the Israeli people. Yes. That's what we go to war for. That's the purpose of going to war, right? That's the goal here. And if on a strategic level, in order to protect the home front, in order to protect our society, we need to do certain actions to the point of taking out Hamas entirely out of Gaza. Again, that's going to be the question they have to ask. But if that is what was necessary here, then we're going to have to develop a military strategy to accomplish that goal. And we're going to have to think long and hard about if we need to do that to protect all of those citizens in Sderot, in Ashkelon, in Tel Aviv and elsewhere. Unfortunately, we're going to have to take actions that are going to at times put the hostages at risk. That is, I think, inevitable right now. And it's a horrific, horrific situation. And I, I think that we're going to have a clear sense of the numbers. The reason why we don't have a clear sense of the numbers right now for the number of captives is because we're still identifying bodies and corpses and it's taking a long time. But we're going to have a better sense of this, I think, coming up. And um, we're just going to have to, I think, be honest. And this is going to be the most difficult thing for the Israeli leadership is to be honest about what it is we're trying to accomplish and what we're willing to do. And here, I think it's going to be the greatest test of leadership because I agree. that is going to be super difficult for any politician who has to be elected and any politician who's in a society which always says, we will do everything to bring back our soldiers. Um, and, and that's going to be really, really complicated for us to say. The one thing I'd add, though, I think the mistake we've made over many years is we treated live hostages, ours, right, and dead corpses the same way. Yes. So, you know, we traded, we gave away all, let all these prisoners go in order to bring back the bodies of soldiers killed in Lebanon. And it's a wonderful value to bring people back for burial. It's mit mitzvah, we call it in Hebrew. But that should have never been done. And I think we really need to distinguish now between trying to save people's lives as opposed to bringing people back for burial. Those are two sure. different types of goals. Right. Until until this week, there were two live hostages, civilians in, in Gaza, and the bodies of two soldiers, um, the remains, whatever whatever there is. And now they're, according to Elliot, as many as 300, and that does change things. Elliot, is there anything you want to add to that? I'm curious. I want to take it a little wider, but I'm curious... No, I, I, I think that um, Rabbi Brody wrote, put the dilemma very, very, very okay. clearly. 
Okay. Um, we we have to decide what what we're doing as a country, keeping in mind that we're starting today. They raised the number to thirteen hundred. I have news for you; it's higher than that. With thirteen hundred dead as the opening of the operation. Um, you know, we're we're at fifty percent of the death toll of the Yom Kippur War. Correct. In a week. On day on day one. Uh, day one, right. Right. Uh, you know, so I, I think I think that also is part of the calculation. We've we've always tried and and, and correctly so try to, to keep our casualties civilian and military at a level where we can you know imagine them, count them. Uh, I think we should also make clear two thirds of the dead have not been identified because of what Hamas did to the bodies. Okay. Which is they why are, people are giving DNA. Yes, they are visually unrecognizable. Got it. Okay. Um, what happens if we? What happens if we? What happens if a, another front is opened? Uh, I, I think what we're if I if I can conclude thus far, we're all saying here, or you're both saying that we're in the midst of a of a brutal obligatory war, and the and the goal at least. It ought to be the the elimination of Hamas, despite what what may come, and that's a that's a whole separate uh, separate issue, not for now. But what if Elliot, uh, uh, twenty six hours ago, there was a false alarm that you and a million Israelis across northern Israel were under siege in some capacity from Lebanon? What if that what what if that is no longer a technical mistake but in fact happens and how does that challenge us militarily and how does that challenge us ethically okay so militarily um it's a challenge obviously a two-front war is different from a one-front war but it's for that reason that the order was given to call up over three hundred thousand reservists in other words the north is being bolstered in part, and, and, and this is this is simply proper military thinking. You you bolster your border to deter, but to have enough force in case deterrence fails to be able to deal with it. So it, it, it's not just symbolic; it's 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 for real physical. Um, I think that that the greatest challenge will be to the air force that'll have to divide its forces the, because the ground forces are allocated. In other words, the divisions in the south are in the south, and the divisions in the north are in the north. Um, unlike what happened in 06, where the decision was made not to call up reserves initially, and just just to remind anybody who, who has forgotten, the 06 war with Hezbollah started with an operation in Gaza to try to get Gilad Shalit out. And then the north okay. erupted, the Gaza operation was shut down, and the forces were moved from Gaza up to Lebanon because the decision was made not to call up the reserves. Here, the decision was made a priori to call up reserves for both fronts. And I believe, first of all, that that will greatly reduce that and, and American involvement, uh, which is a whole sub subject in itself. But for example, the moving of the carrier task force into the Eastern Mediterranean, the very, very clear support of the American administration um, have reduced the likelihood of a Hezbollah involvement significant okay. significant okay and what i would say is if i had to bet i would bet that they won't but i wouldn't bet a lot of money okay. because it's the middle east okay rabbi brody what happens if we have that second front if elliot bets a little bit and loses and and we do have a second front or a third front where does that leave us on a, on a military ethics basis well I, I think the same issues are going to come up here right but it's the same issues in terms of how you fight the war. But I think it's going to highlight even more how we cannot risk our soldiers. We're going to have to protect our soldiers. If you're on two fronts, you, you're going to be in a very dangerous situation. By the way, if it's a two-front war, it's not just the fronts that are going to be in danger. Hezbollah's missiles right. are much more potent. The range is much further. Yeah. Uh, and those and of us the, quantity, Modine, and the quantities are much greater. Correct. And so those of us like myself and Modine who don't 
usually get a siren, are going to be sitting in bomb shelters for quite some time. So it's it's not going to be so simple there. And I think that's, once again, is going to highlight when you're at greater risk, you have to make sure that you're taking more steps to ensure that you're protecting your forces and you're doing things for decisive and quick victories. Because the longer you let this drag out, you know, the, the harder it's going to, to be. So I think on an ethical level, having a second front only pushes us in that direction. I think what, one of the interesting questions that's come up on an ethical and strategic level is, right now we're doing a siege. And part of the reason why I think we're doing a siege and not sending in forces, I, I suspect we're not actually ready to go in. I, I think the army wasn't ready, and I'm not sure they're totally ready, but who knows. But the other reason is that siege is a very powerful tactic. And we prefer to do that than send the ground forces and prefer to do that than try to, you know, bring in Hezbollah. And it's going to be interesting to see if we have the fortitude to keep that up and if the world understands that that is a better alternative than the, us going in. That's an so, excellent point. So wait, uh, Elliot, I know you want to comment, but I want to throw something in. I, I, I've been monitoring the questions here. There, there's somebody... I just want to state for the record, I don't like it when people join a webinar and are anonymous. Uh, that that, But there's somebody here who's an anonymous attendee who's asked a legitimate question. Question is, and it relates to the siege, can you comment on the withholding of food, water, and medicine to Gaza? Is this a violation of the rules of war? How do we respond to criticism of Israel? No, First of all, sie sieges are perfectly legitimate means. Um, certainly, as, as Rabbi Brody pointed out, if, if the alternative is massive assault, uh, a siege is, is both a military step, but it's also a communication step. It, it's one that, that gives the other side the opportunity to give up, walk away. Doesn't mean they're going to do it, but it's it's a coercive action rather than a pure force action. Okay. Right. Brody. And, and, and where we're going to get the criticism from, and this again is why it's so important to have a proper ethical framework. People are going to say, yes, but you're violating the human rights of non-combatants because we all understand that siege is going to actually worse effect, right? Greater effect the yes. non-combatants. Hamas has ways of making sure their fighters have food, right? So it's going to be this other people that are going to be starving faster than the Hamas fighters. And so people are going to give the rhetoric of humanitarian rhetoric and human rights, and this is a violation. And I think the answer in this particular case is, again, if you think that Israel has the right, and not the right, the obligation to defend itself, which entails going to war, well, which is the better option? And the better option here is the siege. It's preferable on a lot of different levels, Thank you. strategic and moral. And But that's going to be a hard argument to make when all those images come from starving children in Gaza. Agreed. Whether it's real or not, Hamas has not been known to create, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, a fake, fake, uh, fake news. Um, yes. and, and that's, but, but yes, there is a complete siege right now. Uh, but by the way, I, I just want to add, I'm, I'm the host, not a panelist. I just want to add the siege is from, from the Israeli side. Egypt still has an open border. Egypt can do whatever they want. Egypt can, 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 uh, can let the United Nations bring in, uh, truckloads of humanitarian relief and fuel and anything that they want. The fact that Egypt is not doing that at this stage. Um, also, also uh, calls them into m makes them accomplices uh, for good and for bad. Am I mistaken? No, you're you're correct. Although part of the siege is that we cut off their electricity, their water. Uh, that that's probably more significant than food. I, I my guess is that the average family has a few days of food, and the fact is you you can go a couple of weeks without food without any serious clinical impact. But didn't I see, Elliot, somewhere that when they were building the tunnels, they were also installing solar panels above them so that we oh, could, they, they could harvest the sun in their, coast, in their coastal strip? Of course. 
as you pointed out, Hamas or 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 one of you pointed out, Hamas is not going to suffer directly from it. The suffering is going to be indirect. But Napoleon once said, sometimes you do things just to irritate the enemy. Okay. And th in this case, the civilians being cut off and you know major electricity, water, and that sort of thing being cut off is not may not affect Hamas in the existential sense, but it's certainly going to make it more difficult for them to operate. Okay, Brody, anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, I I think that uh, I think Ali's point here is is, is fair. Um, I I think that the role of Egypt here is going to be interesting. Egypt has a lot of different interests here. They're getting a lot of pressure from the Arab League and the Arab world right now. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they respond to that. Okay. Um, I want to begin to wrap up uh, by by trying to address some of the questions and invite anyone else who has questions to use the Q&A. Before I do that, um, and also maybe it will preclude having to ask some of these questions, um, either Rabbi Brody or Elliot, is there anything that, I mean, this is a broad cut topic and we could go all night um, and and in multiple days, uh, what relating to the broad topic of fighting an ethical war against an unethical enemy have we not discussed that is burning on your mind that needs to be put out there before we start questions? Well, for me, only one um, one lesson that I've taught for many, many years, both in the military and, and the university when I cover this topic with, with college students, and that is that when somebody is holding a loaded gun to your head and says, I want to kill you, it greatly simplifies your decision making. Okay. And it doesn't mean that you automatically become unethical, but it does mean that ethics suddenly mean a lot less than they meant a few minutes ago because somebody holding a loaded gun to your head and says they're going to kill you. And Hamas has moved into that category and if Hezbollah gets involved it's going to take that category and bring it up on, on, on steroids so okay. the it doesn't mean you, you become an unethical person but it means that the immediacy of the situation puts ethics at a lower level of your, your priorities Rabbi Brody you agree with that? Ethics should always be here up front and center but part of ethics, as I was arguing earlier, and I assume Ali will agree with this, is that you have to protect yourself and you have to win. Battles are necessary to win. Precisely so, and I, so I think it's important for us, and this is why it's critical. There are two points I want to make that are critical about facing an unethical enemy. Winning a battle, that is an ethical imperative. It's not just strategic. It's not just a matter of interest. There's especially, if you think you have a just cause here, there's an ethical imperative to uproot that evil. So that, that's one thing to keep in mind. We shouldn't let this, I hate when people frame it as, on the one hand, you have ethics, on humanitarianism, on the other hand, you have political and strategic you know, interest. Uh, that's a terrible binary way of thinking about things here. Yeah. But the other thing I want to mention, though, is that part of the thing we have to always remember is our soldiers are human beings who we want to be able to walk out of this experience and they should be able to look themselves in the mirrors and feel like they did the right thing. And it's always very important that we recognize yeah. we want our soldiers to be able to walk away from this experience and saying we had to do horrible things, but they were ethical things. They were ethical actions. Things we didn't want to do. That doesn't mean they're not ethical. And so Whenever we're facing an unethical enemy like this, with the temptation is always going to be just do whatever it takes. And we're going to have to do a lot of things here. But we should do it within a framework that allows our soldiers and our people, but primarily our soldiers, to be able to look themselves in the mirror afterwards and said, I acted ethically to protect our people. Okay, excellent. Um, I, I want to start to get, th thank you for this. I want to start trying to, filter through some of the questions. Um, I, I don't know you, David Meshaloff, but you are very prolific. And I, pr I apologize in advance, we're not gonna get to all your questions, but the last one is real profound because it impacts even beyond the, uh, 
the borders and the population of the state of Israel. Um, must we take into consideration the effect that our war may have on the safety of Jews in other parts of the world? It might awaken the hatred toward Jews, which we've seen, um, who are not where the IDF can protect them. Should that limit our behavior? I don't think so. I, I think that we have an obligation to deal. I know it's, the, the, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism, anti-Israel behavior and how that impacts each other is horrific. There's clearly going to be some threats of anti-Semitism in a lot of Jewish communities around the world. It's an area of concern. I don't think Israel can be held hostage to that concern. And I also don't think that anything we do here in Israel is going to change the fact that people are going to use this as an excuse or whatnot to attack Jews in other places around the world. So we just have to fight and fight well and fight ethically. And uh, the faster we do that, the better. Elliot, would you change anything militarily if uh, knowing no, that I, there are Jew Jews outside of, of Israel who are going to potentially? I, sub I subscribe 100% to what Rabbi Brody said. Okay. Very good. Um, Elliot, back to you. There's a random question, but it's a good question. And I'm going to I'm going to pose it and I'm going to ask you to follow up with me afterward um, to send a follow up on on uh, after Shabbat. Um, uh, someone's looking at your bookshelf and sees books, which is which I'm impressed that someone's paying attention to that. Um, I see the name Hezbollah and Ham Hamas on two of them. Curious to know. If these books we as a community should be reading, what books can or should we be reading to help people around the world have a better understanding of the challenges faced when fighting these terrorist organizations? Elliot, I see you're showing off your uh, small library just, there. Just, um, just, just, just the immediate ones next to my desk. Just the ones on that side. Um, so I think it's a great question, not for now, but I'd love to get a, a book list, a recommended book list that people who care should read. Um, not a problem. All right, excellent. Uh, I'm seeing more questions. I'm just trying to sort through them all. Would e do either of you want to copy to comment on on a, a, a tomorrow's World Day of Jihad? Um, how that impacts us um, militarily, ethically. Um, when I go out to buy my groceries in the morning before Shabbat in the Judean mountains, do I need to be particularly mindful of World Day of Jihad traffic or something? I'm mindful of it every day. I didn't know that, that there was a special day for World <laughs> Jihad. Yeah, I, I think it's the same issue that we said beforehand as well. We've got to do what we have to do in terms of Gaza and protecting ourselves. But of course, uh, Elliot, you're absolutely correct. I mean, this threat always existed. It has existed. It's been manifested. There have been these ty many types of horrific attacks. And we, you know, I think we're reminded in a very painful, painful way this weekend about how acute the threat was. And, you know, I want to highlight the fact that we said for many years already, Hamas is ISIS, right? We, we would talk that way about them. And we believed it, but we never believed, I think, that they'd be able to do what ISIS was able to do. And so now that they, in mass, right? Of course, they did horrific things, as you mentioned before, Elliot. And I think we just have to recognize the fact that we, we face evil and we're facing evil in many ways as part of the frontier of the Western world. And so it's important for us to send a message to the West right now also about the fortitude that we need to have, which is now, again, not just a strategic question. It's a moral question. It's a moral statement to the world. We have to fight evil and uproot it from the world. Okay. Um, uh, uh, David, again, who I would love to meet you and have coffee, uh, you're asking some great questions. Um, I, I, I think I'm going to save them all and see if I can create with Rabbi Brody and Elliot maybe a written response to some of these. But there's something else that you ask on a different dimension, uh, which I want to bring up. I can't get to all of them right now. Um, in considering the question of non-combatants, how does one balance God's command not to murder with one's knowledge that we have experienced for many millennia that the children who survive will be taught by their friends and mothers to hate us and seek revenge so that it would be ethical to kill them now so that we would not have to be threatened by them in the future? I, I personally face that. I won't go into the details, um, but the 
The broad detail is quite a number of years ago in Gaza faced a Hamas terrorist who was holding his own child as a human shield. Oh, yeah. While firing at us. And to make a very long story very short, I had a sniper in place. We took him out. And my lessons were as follows. One, I killed one terrorist and created another. Two, I cared more about his child than he did. And three is that he knew it because otherwise he wouldn't have used him as a human shield. Whoa, excellent. And Rabbi Brody? I, and I believe that, that it was the right decision. Okay. Uh, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi Meshalaf, uh, I do know, is asking a great question, but I'll respond to a biblical story where, which is sort of brought out in the Talmud, in which there's a debate about whether a king, if you know you're going to have an evil son, should you bring him into this world? And the prophet tells the king and says, you got to bring children into the world. There's nothing deterministic here and inevitable. Right. And so, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I, I think part of being a religious person, and this is part of our values we have to keep in mind is, is a belief in the possibility of goodness and the belief in the possibility of change. And that seems very difficult to believe when you think about the Arab-Israeli conflict. And that's why we have prof prophecies, which tell us to believe in uh, wow. some form of g better future. So I think it's important to keep hope for that. But in the meantime, uh, to act wisely and to act ethically in order to protect ourselves. Um, I, I, I'm loving this conversation and I'm so grateful. Um, unless anyone else has more questions, which I'm inviting one last round, I've got one last question also from David Meshelot. The story told in Bamid Bar of Israel vowing to go to absolute war against those who abducted one little girl, which brought us victory and praise from God, does it teach us anything about what is ethical to do today? Did Israel then have to be concerned that when they went to war, the enemy would murder that captured girl? If yes, uh, shall we learn from that from today? Um, and for the, mo <laughs> thank you, David. For the moment, I'll leave you with five questions, although I have more. Well, it's a great biblical story. I think the thing we learn from the biblical story there is that um, the Jewish people need to care about all of our members. And so every individual counts. And we have to do things to protect our members. But, you know, if there'd be a situation in which by going to war, we would clearly endanger so many more and put ourselves in a worse situation. I don't think we've gone to war in Bamidbar and the Book of Numbers. And I don't think we necessarily do that today. Um, so, but, you know, I do think it's a powerful story that teaches us that every person counts. And in that respect, it's important reminder for us that we do have captives. We do need to care about them. I mean, we really, really need to care about them. But having said that, we have a lot of different values here that we need to care about as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Elliot, did you want to add anything biblically? No, I think that that covers it. Um, Very good. There have been some great questions. I'm grateful for this. At this point, I am bringing in uh, two good friends and one who I don't know yet. Um, we're going to close out. Um, as we do with all of our programs. Oh, and I need to make you all co-panelists, co-hosts, so you can so we can see you, which I learned from the mistake the other night. Make co-host and make co-host. And we just want to close in, uh, al almost close in prayer before I make a couple of announcements. So I'm going to go alphabetically um, and invite um, a really dear family friend, uh, Dan Coyne in Washington State, to close us out with the first of the three prayers. Jonathan, thank you. Uh, Rabbi Brody and Elliot, thank you as well. I can't tell you how much I appreciate these briefings and these webinars. They are, uh, they make us feel like we have a direct line into what's going on in the state and we so appreciate it. Here's my prayer. God, our heavenly father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hear our prayer and our plea for safety and security to be restored in Israel. For family members, friends, and all who have lost loved ones, 
we declare your shalom surrounds and comforts them in this moment. For the hostages and the families, we declare your comfort and mercies upon them. For all who have family and friends engaged in military operations today, may they rest in shalom knowing you are in control. I declare that your word is still true today and for all days so we can trust that you are not surprised by any of the happen happenings in Israel this day, but that you will turn all of this evil that has been unleashed on Israel for good. We stand on this word, this promise today and every day. We declare that no further weapons formed against Israel will prosper and that the fiery darts of the enemy will be turned back upon his own head. We thank you that the Jewish people in the Israeli government are ethical and moral in their response to Hamas to seek justice. That is a pure and true gift to humankind. God Almighty, we declare that your original land grant to the Jewish people be protected for all time. Adonai Elohim, unleash everyone on this call to consider and fulfill their best offering to Genesis 123 Foundation Israel Emergency Campaign. You know our capability and your plan for each of us in this moment. May it be fulfilled just as you desire. Finally, for our part, after we leave this gathering today, let us all continue in fervent prayer for the Jewish people, the state of Israel, for its leaders, and for your wisdom and guidance every step of the way forward. Amen. Thank you, Dan. I'm Sarah Dweck. We've never met, but I'm grateful you're here. Hi, Jonathan. Nice to meet you. Also, hi, nice Rabbi. Nice. Um, so you wanted me to read the prayer for the state of Israel and for the soldiers? If you're good with that, yeah, that'd be lovely. It's okay. So I'll read it in Hebrew first, and then I'll read the English translation. Great. Okay. This is the prayer for the state of Israel. Avinu shebashamayim, sur Yisrael begoalo, barechet medinat Yisrael, rishit tzmichat geulatenu. Hagen aleha bevrat chastecha, ufrosh aleha sukot shlomecha, ushlach orcha veamitecha leroshea, sareha veyoatzea, vetenakem veetza tovam lefanecha. חזק <laughs> בקצה השמיים משם יקבצך אדוני אלוהיך ומשם יקחך וביחה אדוני אלוהיך את הארץ אשר ירושו אבותיך וירשת ויביתך וירבך מאמותיך ומה לאדוני אלוהיך את לבביך ואת לבב זרעך ואהבה את אדוני אלוהיך וכל לבבך וכל נפשך למען חייך ויחד לבבנו לאהבה ולירא את שמך, ולשמור את כל דברי תורתך. ושלח לנו מהרה בן דוד משיכה צדקך, לפתות מח... מחכי קץ ישועתך. הופה והדר גאון הוא זכה, על כל יושבי תבל ארצך. ויאמר כל אשר נשמה באפו, אדוני אלוהיך, אדוני אלוהי ישראל מלך ומלכותו בכל מה שעלה, אמן זלה. And now for the English translation. Sorry, I scrolled back up. Avino Shabashamai, rock and redeemer of Israel, bless the state of Israel, the start of flowering of redemption. Shield it with your love, spread over it the shelter of your peace. Guide its leaders and advisors with your light and your truth. Establish for them your good counsel. Strengthen the hands of the defenders of our holy land, cause them to inherit our God deliverance. Place the crown of victory upon them. 
give the land peace and everlasting joy to its inhabitants and visit all our brethren in the house of Israel and all the lands where they are scattered and bring them rapidly to Zion, your city, and to Jerusalem, where your name lives. As it says in the Torah of Moses, your servant, even if your dwelling is at the end of the sky, God will congregate you from there and bring you from there. And you will bring towards the land that your forefathers inherited and you will inherit it. And God shall benefit you and multiply your numbers greater than your forefathers. Then the Lord your God will open up your heart and hearts to, of your offspring to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul in order that you may live. Unify our hearts to love and worship your name and to keep all that is in your Torah and to send the and send us the son of David, the Messiah of your justice, to receive, to redeem us for those who wait for your salvation. Appear with the glory and the pride of your strength in front of all the inhabitants of the universe and all of those who have the breath to say the God of Israel is the king and he reigns over everything. Amen forever. Amen. Um, and now the blessing for the Israeli Defense Force. מי שברך אבותינו אברהם יצחק ויעקב, הוא יברך את חיילי צבא ההגנה לישראל, העומדים על משמר ארצנו וערי אלוהינו, מגבול הלבנון ועד מדבר מצרים, ומן הים הגדול עד לבוא הערבה ביבשה ועברו בים. ייתן אדוני את, אבותי, את אויבינו הקמים עלינו, נפגים לפניהם. הקדוש ברוך הוא ישמור ויציל את חיילינו מכל צרה וצוקה ומכל נגע ומחלה. וישלח ברכה והצלה בכל מעשה ידיהם. ידבר שונאינו תחתם ויעטרם בכתר ישועה ובעטרת ניצחון. ויקוים בהם הכתוב. כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולך עמכם נילחם לכם עם אויביכם נואשיע אתכם. ונאמר אמן. May he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, bless the soldiers of the Israel of the Israel Defense Forces and their standing guard upon our land and the cities of our God, from the border of the Lebanon to the wilderness of Egypt, from the Great Sea to the approach of the Arava, on land, in the air, and in the sea. May the Lord give our enemies that rise against us plagues in front of them. May the Holy One, blessed be he, guard and rescue our soldiers from all trouble and distress, from all affliction and illness, and send blessing and success in all the work of their hands. May he crush those that hate us below, below them and crown them with the crown of salvation and with the wreath of victory. And through them, let the verse be fulfilled, for it is the Lord your God that walks with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And let us say amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, Pastor Dave McGarra uh, in, in Iowa, who is also the co-host of a great uh, radio program heard widely called The Teacher and the Preacher. Welcome. This has been so helpful. I so appreciate it. And I just have loved these prayers. My battery is going to die. My prayer is going to be short, but my heart is with you. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we have a God like you that we can call upon. We lift and intercede and stand the gap on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people. I agree with the prayers that have been prayed and pray that there would be great, great things that happen by your hand, your hand of protection, your hand of provision, your gift of wisdom to those who lead militarily and those who lead politically. We pray, oh God, you will deliver the captives and that you'll give victory, Lord, to the efforts, help all of our soldiers to do better than they can do. Surround them with a hedge of protection. Provide, provide for them what you did for Elijah when you said that there are more of us than there are more of them. May that be so. Thank you for the blessing of this time. Meet the needs of Genesis 1, 2, 3. May there be generosity and charity given. And may you bless all who give and all who pray. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, well, just a couple of last quick announcements. First of all, my profound thanks uh, by Brody, Elliot Chodoff, uh, for being. This is a fabulous conversation that needs to be shared widely, especially in the context of what's, um, what's coming in this war. I pray that everyone listening and following this will make sure that their churches and synagogues 
um, resound with prayer for Israel and our soldiers this week. Um, I want to ask and encourage everybody to consider donating. I know there are many opportunities, um, some of them that are more and less kosher. Um, I'm striving to make the, the highest level impact with what we can at the highest integrity of the Genesis 123 Foundation Israel Emergency Fund. Um, I'd like to uh, ask for you to, to join that and share. Um, the link to that is love.genesis123.co, love.genesis123.co. And we have three basic pillars. We're going to be providing non-military uh, support and resources and love for the soldiers. We are providing um, civilian security for outlying communities like in the Gaza border and, and here where I live in, in the Judean mountains and not far from where Elliot lives um, in, the, in the Lebanese border and other places. And the third of which, which, um, which caused me to cry today, uh, we've been providing support for a number of years to a, um, a facility in Sterot, the city that's right on the Gaza border um, that deals with at-risk youth. Um, I texted them immediately on Sunday morning to ask what they needed and how we could help. And day one and two and three and four and five came and I didn't hear back and it terrified me. And today, when I finally heard back, I broke down. Um, thank God the woman who I'm in touch with there and she and her family are okay. I don't know the rest of the status of the children in the community, but these are desperately needing uh, all kinds of services, all kinds of love. My goal is that we can provide a year's worth of therapies for all of the kids um, at least in one or two or three of the areas that they're doing that. So I just want to uh, implore everybody to, to share it, to, to participate, but more importantly than your own individual participation, to share this and know that we will, um, we will manage the, the, the responsibility of, of these funds with the greatest level of integrity and all the money will go to these causes. Again, it's love.genesis123.co and especially for our friends who are outside of Israel, um, when you make that donation, you have an opportunity to send your own prayers and words of encouragement that we will make. We will run out of paper and then stock up and run out again, making copies of in order to uh, strengthen and encourage our soldiers, our security officers, our children and everyone who, and families and everyone who's working. Uh, in the causes. We're, we're an hour and a half into this program. It's been delightful, it's been inspiring, it's been um, informative and provocative, and I'm grateful for everyone participating. Um, I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom that we should not turn on our TVs and radios and phones uh, Saturday night this week and hear of any more horrors, um, but hear of uh, progressing toward the solution, the, 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 the proper military outcome that needs to happen and pray that all of our soldiers will come home safe. Thank you all. God bless you. Shabbat shalom.